Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks that you come and you make yourself present amongst us when we gather round your word. That even though we're dispersed, we're united by your spirit. Speak to us now. We long to hear your voice. Amen. We've heard a lot about sacrifice this past 12 months. Different people have made all sorts of sacrifices to protect each other from COVID-19. Grandparents have given up precious time and hugs with grandkids. For long periods of time, some medics have moved out of family homes, lest they bring home to vulnerable family members infection from their place of work. Different faith groups have sacrificed their major festivals, or at the very least, they've stopped celebrating them in their usual ways. In the last few months, we have been allowed to continue meeting for public worship, but alongside many other faith groupings, we have been urged to set aside that right for the greater good. We've been asked to make sacrifices. Across the country, Christmas celebrations were cut short, curtailed, or abandoned together. These sacrifices may have even been the cause of anger and frustration when we encounter people playing fast and loose with the guidance. And even now, as we start following the roadmap out of lockdown, we're being urged to be cautious to not undo all the hard work and sacrifices that we've made in these last 12 months. Sacrifice is a theme which is very much in keeping with the season we're in, not just in terms of COVID, but when we think of the season of Lent. It's a time when we prepare ourselves to focus on the sacrifice God made for us in Jesus Christ and consider our response to that sacrifice. So you may have chosen to give up something for Lent. And as we consider this theme of worship in the wilderness, it's very appropriate that we speak of a sacrificial journey. And it's also appropriate that today is the Sunday we think of that theme. It's Mother's Day. It's true that this can be a day which stirs up a whole range of emotions for a wide variety of reasons. But if we're truly blessed, many of us will have reason to be thankful for having known parental love. We may be aware of sacrifices our parents, our mothers made on our behalf. And it may not be restricted to earthly family models either. One of the Bible's images of the church is of a family or household of faith. And it's as good a time as any to give thanks for mothers in the faith, those sisters who have nurtured and guided us in the ways of Jesus, often at great personal cost. In terms of giving of themselves, their time, their emotions, perhaps even financially. And let's be honest, often they've done so within a body or an institution that hasn't valued or affirmed them in the way Jesus did. It would be fair to say that sacrifice has been a central part of how people have related to gods for as long as people have believed in gods. In so many different parts of our world, archaeologists or anthropologists will find evidence of people sacrificing to God. Perhaps seeking help, asking the gods to send the rain for harvest or to give thanks for some blessing they've received. There's even horrific evidence of child sacrifice from all sorts of ancient cultures around the world. But for us, as followers of Jesus, sacrifice has a different dimension. It's one of the reasons I talked of the image of family or 
household of faith. For sacrifice is the character key the key character trait of our God. It's the finding basis of our faith and our faith family. It's central to the Christian view of the world. How we believe God works in the world. How God establishes his kingdom in the world. Question. How do you envisage God? What kind of words would you fall back on to try to describe what God is really like? Now let me take you to one of perhaps the key image in scripture. We find it towards the very back of the Bible, Revelation chapter 5. To set the scene, the previous chapter included a vision of worship far grander than anything the might and majesty of Rome, the most powerful empire the world had ever known, could ever hope to cobble together. And then in chapter 5, the drama begins. John sees in the hand of the one who sits on the throne of the world a sealed scroll. The scroll seems to represent God's good hopes, plans and purposes for the world. To open it is to be given the, be given the power to bring those hopes, plans and purposes to fruition. But after searching all of humanity, past and present, there's no one found capable of opening it. Catch 22. Unless that scroll is opened, the world can't be rescued. And there's no one to open it. And John weeps. It seems we're doomed. But suddenly John's guide interrupts him. Stop weeping, he says. Look, the lion of the tribe of Judah has won the victory. He can do it. He is worthy to open the scroll. Close your eyes for a moment. I want you to imagine a lion. Not just any lion. One which can take on all comers. Yes, there might be those who want to oppose this lion. They got no chance. Got that mental picture? John's invited to look up and see this lion. What do you expect him to find? What follows is quite deliberately comical. What does John see? Not a lion, but a little slaughtered lamb. The one who holds the fate of the world is not yet another super powerful beast. It's a little lamb. Down the years I've sung hymns and songs which have spoken about the lion and the lamb. And they're kind of taken from this part of Revelation. But if you look carefully, there is no lion. Just a lamb. The only way that Jesus is a lion of the tribe of Judah is that he's a descendant of the tribe of Judah whose symbol was a lion. There is no lion and a lamb. The lion is a lamb. Throughout history, those who have sought to rule our world and control its destiny have sought to do so with the power of a lion, to enforce their will on the end of a sword or the barrel of a gun. In Revelation, the key thing that is revealed is that at the centre of God's plan to save the world is not yet another powerful beast, but a little lamb. 
Indeed, the destructive power of the lamp is the path Jesus refuses to take. Our God establishes his rule and redeems the world, not with the might of a lion, but with sacrificial, suffering love revealed in Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. So yes, in common with cultures and peoples from around the world throughout history, sacrifice has a central place in our faith. But not in terms of what we have to sacrifice to our God but in terms of what our God has given to us. Is it any wonder that when our writers of the New Testament scoured the Old Testament to find ways of explaining the story of the God revealed in Jesus, that the passage they turned to more than any other was the passage we shared this morning? Isaiah 53. In Jesus, God comes amongst us as flesh, vulnerable, like a root in the less than promising environment of dry ground. He was so easily overlooked. I often joke that as I've got older, when I've been in shops and so on, remember that? Remember the days we went to shops? But I think, I think I've gained the superpower of invisibility. Nobody seems to notice me. I might as well not be there. Except in one circumstance. When I wear one of these. It's a clerical collar. A bit of plastic, about 8.5 inches long, 1 inch wide. It makes a huge difference. Especially if I'm dealing with someone in some sort of position of responsibility. And if I broaden up the Irish accent, it takes it up another notch. And that's why I use it sparingly. And normally only when I'm acting on behalf of others. But when God comes amongst us in Jesus, there's none of that. For the vast majority of his life, he lived in a relative obscurity of a backwater town that people dismissed. They used to say, can anything good come from that place? When they talked about Nazareth. And yes, there were moments when the crowds flocked to him. They clamoured for his attention. But all too often, they got what they wanted and moved on. At times they even wanted him to be their king, but only on their terms. They wanted him to be a lion, and he came amongst them as a lamb. And faced with a lion, what good is a lamb? And so he was despised. He knew sorrow, disappointment, hurt, rejection, betrayal, misunderstanding, deliberate misrepresentation. For all the healings, miracles, teachings, he ended up on the cross alone. And there he faced down all the evil, sin, corruption of the world. All of it converging on him on that one moment. He reaches the point where he experiences the utter desolation and isolation of the wilderness. Where he feels utterly forsaken even by God. But even then, he refuses to lean into the destructive power of the world. He refuses to lean on the power of the lion. He doesn't cry out in vengeance. He doesn't call down angels. Like the sheep before his shears, he's silent. Except to say, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Because suffering, sacrificial love, is at the heart of of God's plans and purposes for the world. 
and he breathes his last, he enters into death itself. Who would have believed any report that this was God come amongst us? But there's another bit of that picture from Revelation that's kind of slipped past. The lamb looks like it's been slain, but it's standing. Christ enters into death. But he doesn't stay there. Death can't hold him. He emerges, risen from the grave. Now, not for nothing does Peter describe the enemy as a lion, prowling around looking for someone to devour. But that lion has been faced down and overcome by a lamb through suffering, sacrificial love nothing can keep us from the love of God for all the sin and the evil of the world has converged on Jesus and on that cross and he's pronounced forgiveness over it all they've done their worst and he's overcome them in resurrection he's walked our road He's got covered in our dust. He has entered our wilderness so that when we find ourselves there, we can know we have a God who has been there before us and will be waiting to meet us and bring us through. He has come to save, not condemn. For at the heart of the, his plans for the world is suffering, sacrificial love. His wilderness journey was a sacrificial journey. This is our God. Is it any wonder we struggle to believe? At the heart of our faith is not the sacrifices we have to make to get on side with God, but what God has done to draw us into relationship with himself. In Christ, God is reconciled to us. But reconciliation involves two. Will we be reconciled to him? Will we take him at his word and enter into that relationship with him? That's not to say there's no space for sacrifice within the Christian life. When we enter the family or household of God, sacrificial love is to be the family trait we inherit. It's to become the culture in which we live and operate. Not to get God on our side, because he's already there. But because we are taking our place in God's plans and purposes for the world. And at the heart of those plans is sacrificial love. And it's through us that that love is to be made known. Think about it for a moment. How did you become aware of the love of God? Was it not through others? And how was it made real to you? It won't just be through what they said, but because it was embodied in someone who shared it. They made it flesh. The God we believe in will shape the person we become. And the person we become will determine the God others encounter in us. So if our God is petty, mean, judgmental, that in time will shape us. And in turn be what others see. If our God is a God of sacrificial love. That would be a whole lot different. The journey of discipleship will take us through the wilderness. And at times it will be a sacrificial journey. At times that journey might be a struggle and it might be painful. Not despite faith. But because of it. But we can go there 
knowing ours is a God who has been there before us, who has come through it and has promised to be with us and lead us through. And so we offer sacrificial love, not to win God's favour, for we already have it. We offer it because it's the way that the love of God is spread and made known. It's the way others encounter that great love with which we have been blessed. And God won't be your debtor. Nothing offered to him will be lost. The journey in the wilderness is a sacrificial one. But our sacrifices enfolded in God's plans and purposes for the world. For at the heart of God's plan is a suffering, sacrificial lamb who has faced down all that would keep us from God. And he has overcome. Grace and peace to you. Amen.